Well, if I can invite you back to your chairs. And as you make your way there, you can open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. I want to extend an invitation to all of you to lunch next Sunday. So next Sunday after church in this room, we're going to have lunch together. So please just mark your calendars. We have a big plan set up so you can hang out afterwards for an hour and a half or so and just have lunch. We'll have lunch provided. And so we're really looking forward to that. I'm sure you're able to just stay in fellowship together, maybe get to know some of the people you don't in the church. That'll be next Sunday, not, not today. Sorry, we don't have lunch today. But next Sunday, uh, we will have lunch. So just, if you can, stay, be prepared for that. Uh, that's for members, guests, anybody. If you want to invite people who might just come for lunch, that's fine too. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Well, let's read. I, I'd, I'd like to read uh, the entirety of verses 3 through 14. I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that this is one long sentence. Now, now, now there's so much here, we thought it would be more helpful to, to kind of carve it up into different sections to, to benefit from the richness that is in this long sentence from Paul. But um, I, I, I don't want us to miss the fact that this is just one long explosion from Paul. Phrase after phrase comes tumbling out of his mouth. We're going to focus on verses 11 through 14 today, but, but I want us to see them as the, the culminating statement in a long train of glory that Paul has been describing. So let's begin reading in verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 3, and, and then we'll focus this morning on verse 11 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Try to imagine Paul in prison in Rome writing this down. Try to imagine that. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Did my mic just go off, or is that just me? Yeah? Huh? It's off on my end. Hold on just a second, Paul. I'll be back to you in a moment. <laughs> it says dawn. Is it on now? Is it confused? Check. Check one, two, nothing? This looks fine. Let me switch mics. I can. You can hear it? They can hear it? They just want me to shout. Check. There, it's on now. All right, if it goes off again, I'll switch and we'll just, we'll, yeah, that's fine. Yep. Five, I think. Somewhere right there. He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What a sentence. What a sentence. What, what a thought from Paul. And this concluding paragraph, verse 11 through 14, is, is just such a climactic, trumpeting declaration. He says it twice in that paragraph, to the praise of his glory in verse 12. And again, verse 14, to the praise of his glory. Paul is overcome with 
the glory that has been revealed in the person of Christ and what it means to be in union with him for every believer. In 1848, a cry went up across this country, there is gold in California. There is gold in California. We know it as the gold rush. And people from all over the country dropped what they were doing, packed everything they owned, and just started racing across the country, hoping to get there first, hoping to make their fortune. The idea was that you could get to California and almost without any significant labor at all, you could instantly become wealthy, fabulously wealthy. There's just going to be gold. You could, you could just come in and, and pull it off the ground, pluck it out of the streams, and instantly you were going to be uh, beyond your imagination rich. There is gold in California. You can imagine some young person living in Chicago or Pittsburgh or New York hearing this news, going paycheck to paycheck, struggling to earn a living, worried about the future, not sure where the next meal is going to come from, and hearing there's gold in California and, and visions of gold nuggets flowing out of the hills coming to their mind thinking, if I can just get there, that's where all the wealth is. That will transform my life. That's how Paul views union with Christ. He, he would say, there is gold in Christ. There is gold in Christ. It is beyond your imagination. It's beyond your comprehension. It's been there from eternity past. It was revealed in the coming of Jesus and the redemption. And now, in verse 11 through 14, it is present in the future. He would say, look, 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 there is gold in union with Christ. And as we look to the, the future gold that awaits us, he would say, let your future in Christ fill your heart with the praise of his glory. Your future in Christ, Christian, Paul would say, should fill your heart with the praise of his glory. Your heart should be overflowing. If, if you can understand the goal that is present in your future in Christ, <laughs> your heart will overflow. My heart will overflow with the praise of his glory. I, I want to break down this, this passage, just this future-looking section into two points. One claimed by God and the next guaranteed by God. Claimed by God and guaranteed by God. You notice Paul begins again in verse 11 with the phrase, in him we have obtained an inheritance. In him. In him, you, you see that in verse 11, look down in your Bibles. In him we have obtained, so it's in Christ, here we are again, in the sphere that is Christ, in the story that he is the title of, in this place that we come into when we are saved, in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. Now right off the bat in this passage, I have to warn you, we do have to do a little grammar work in this section. All right, We have to do a little grammar work to appreciate what I think is Paul's meaning here, and here is why. Um, the, 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 the Greek phrase that is translated here, we have obtained an inheritance, is a difficult phrase. It's not easy to translate. And this is going to be one of the rare times, very rare, that I am going to, with great respect, disagree with this particular rendering of this phrase. Now, I think the ESV is a fabulous translation. However, there are a number of commentators that I read this week who would say that's probably not the best way to render that original phrase. It, it's not wrong, it's not inaccurate that we have obtained an inheritance. He says that later on, it's the guarantee of our inheritance. We do have an inheritance in God, certainly. That's a valuable biblical truth. However, I think, and smarter people than me also think, uh, that this phrase is not talking about our inheritance in God. It is talking about God's inheritance of us. The actual word that's used there is to be inherited. We have been inherited. You might translate it. We have been inherited. Now, we've also obtained an inheritance, but, but, but here's, I think, what the passage is communicating. We, we have been inherited. It could mean we've obtained an inheritance, but I think it means we have been inherited. Here's what it means. God, in this passage, pictures us as the inheritance 
that he has selected for himself. It's in the passive voice. It's when something acts on the subject of the sentence. We have been inherited. We are inherited. We have been made an inheritance, you might say. In him, we have been inherited. The, the idea here is that God, who owns it all, who will never die, who needs no inheritance, has selected us for his future special possession. It, it references uh, the Old Testament when the Israelites came into the land and they were given special allotments. That was their home. This was their special portion. This was the boundaries that was going to be their place of residence. And here God uses that language, applies it to himself, and says the, the location, the special possession that will belong to him is his people. Amazing. A a astonishing. In him we have been obtained as an inheritance. And then it makes clear who made this happen? We have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We were predestined. We talked about that word earlier. It means being set apart beforehand. And the reason we were set apart beforehand was the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, now Paul just repeats the same concept. We were predestined. We were set apart. Why? The purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Basically, it's, it's saying the same thing again and again and again. God, having kept his own counsel and the one who... All things conform to his will, chose to do this. He chose to set us aside for what? To be his inheritance. God, who knows no obstacles to his will, what he wants happens in his sovereign will. God who orders the universe, who orders the stars, who orders every speck of dust and every sparrow and every king and every president, who orders all things according to the counsel of his own will and wisdom, chose beforehand to set apart a special possession for himself, his chosen lot, as it were. And here's what that lot is. It is those who are in Christ. Incredible. Incredible news. Claimed by God. Claimed by God. Now, pause just a moment with that thought, and I'm going to switch mics so that I'm not bothering anybody anymore. I think this would be better. So pardon me just a second. Robert, thank you for trying. You out there somewhere? All right, check, check. That'd be better. You can probably turn that one down. Are you out there, Robert? I don't see you. You back in the back? Oh, he's back there. Oh, he's hiding. He's behind the curtain. Oh, good. Okay. We have people behind the curtain. Excellent. All right, we're going to use this other microphone because I think it's better and there's less of that buzzy noise that everybody is feeling. So, great. Thank you, Robert, for serving us back there somewhere. Can we give Robert a hand who's feverishly trying to serve? Thank you so much. <laughs> Poor sound guys. You know, they do it great every week, and then the one time something goes weird, and then everybody's like, what's wrong with that microphone? I don't know. Thank you for serving us, guys. You're doing a great job. All right, claimed by God is, is how I would summarize this first section. God, Paul's saying he claimed us. He claimed us. The one who works everything according to the counsel of his own will claimed you as his own inheritance, his special possession. If you remember, do you remember the story of Lot in the Old Testament? If you ever read that story, Abraham and Lot come into the promised land. And when they come into the promised land, Abraham says, choose, choose whatever you want. He, he's just deferential to Lot, even though Lot's the younger man. And he says, Lot, you choose whatever you want. It says Lot looked and he saw this valley and it was beautiful and glorious. And apparently being the selfish man that he is, he chooses that one. So he says, Abraham, you can get whatever you can. I'm choosing the good land. I, I want, this is beautiful. It's well watered and beautiful. I want that land, Lot says. 
says. Well, humanly speaking, that's the normal thing for a person to do. I'll, I'll take the good one. You get two options, bad or good. Which one do you want? I'll take the good one. Thank you. If I get to choose, I'm choosing the good one. God, who has no one he has to share with and no need of an inheritance anyway, who owns everything, who has everything in his own possession, who never has to share ever with anybody, for some reason makes a choice of a special possession, and of all the things to choose, he chooses us. Claimed by God. Claimed by God. For no inherent reason, there's no reason we should be claimed by God, there's no, we're better than somebody else, we looked out and chose the pretty people, or the rich people, or the competent people, no, he just chose to set us apart, and for this specific purpose, for his special possession, amazing good news, amazing good news, God doesn't just save and then set you at a distance. He saves to possess you himself. Claimed by God. Now, Paul makes a a specific in time reference here. Notice in verse 12, he says, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. You know, one of the things I, I, I think that we don't often uh, think about the Bible as a, as a literature book or as a, a book of literature, because we want to be cautious and not compare it to other books of literature. It's not just a book of literature. It's the Word of God, but it's also a book of literature. So you don't have to be scared of seeing literary craftsmanship in the Bible. I mean, God invented literature. Right? So I think this is one of those literary moments of brilliance in the Bible. So here, here's, what Paul, here's what Paul does. Having described all of this that takes place in Christ, and having just said that, that we, he uses the word we, he's used it from verse 3, we, 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 then we have been inherited by God to the praise of his glory, who were the first to hope in Christ. All of a sudden he, he includes this special time reference. I think it introduces a momentary drama, a momentary question into the passage because most likely he's referencing the Jewish believers who first believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Most likely the, the phrase who first were the, the first to hope in Christ, that's those who hoped in Christ beforehand. That's what the, the, the original Greek actually says. Those who hoped in Christ beforehand, probably the original Jewish believers who believed in Jesus as the Messiah. So if you're an Ephesian church member reading this letter, having heard we and we and we and we, all of a sudden Paul introduces, oh, wait, wait a minute. Have you just been talking about like you and your fellow all this time? Is this not apply to us too? Is there some, maybe there's a secondary uh, blessing for us. Maybe our future is good but not great. Maybe, maybe we're not, the inherited ones, maybe we're sort of on the outskirts. And, and you, you could understand that because isn't that true of other religions? Other religions have sort of circles of closeness to God. That's true, for example, in the Mormon faith. There is, there's circles of closeness to God that you can attain some closeness, but not other kinds of closeness, depending on what your life looks like and, and whether you're worthy in particular ways. And we could see that to be in different religions. You're, you're closer or farther from God. So you can imagine an Ephesian who's grown up in a pagan city with sacrifices offered to false gods to attain their favor. The, the, the subtle doubt begins to come in. Oh, okay, I, I understand, Paul. This is, this is for those that have always been chosen of God. God's always chosen Abraham's children by physical descent. You're, you're the inherited ones. You're God's special possession. I, I see where you're going. It's just the, the briefest second of drama that Paul introduces. Chronological drama. And then he answers it in verse 13. In him, you also. In him, you also. And then he continues. You also, he says. 
you also have this same inheritance. You also have believed. You also, the phrase at the end there, a very difficult phrase again in verse 14, it means the redemption of the possession. The redemption of the possession, again, I don't think it means until we acquire possession of it. That that assumes that it's our possession we're talking about. The redemption of the possession, and if you assume that it's God's possession we're talking about, it's God's redemption of his own possession. It's God's redemption of his people. You also, Ephesians, you also, having introduced the the slight chronological drama, we who hoped in Christ beforehand have this incredible privilege of being claimed by God. But guess what, Ephesians? You do too. Guess what, Redemption Hill Church? You do too. If you're in Christ, you do are God's special possession. You are claimed by God. You have the same privilege as those who were the first to hope in Christ. There is no first and second class citizens in Christ. There are those who are God's special possessions and all of them are claimed by God. You have been claimed as God's own possession for his own glory through no merit of our own. This is God's intended future for himself to have a special possession people where he will make them his home and they will be at home with him and that is God's intention for every sinner who has confessed their sins and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Paul is no different than you in that chair. Peter is no different than you in that chair. The ground here is level because of the grace of God. Those who were first to hope in Christ are also with those who were latest to hope in Christ and all to the praise of his glory. Claimed by God, he says. In him we have been obtained, you could render it as an inheritance having been set apart beforehand according to the purpose of him who works all things. He wasn't forced. He works all things to the counsel of his own will. So in the counsel of his own will, so that we, Paul, and his fellow Jewish believers who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. But him, you also, you also have this same privilege. Claimed by God. You know, our, our minds drift towards the future. My, my children are fascinated with the day countdown to Christmas. Now, they, they don't have any sense of what, you know, 19 days is. My three-year-old, how many days till Christmas? 19 days. He doesn't know 19 days. He doesn't know 19 minutes, but he wants to know the count. And we all do that. Adults do the same thing. We count down days to vacation. We count down days to the weekend. We count down days to our birthday. We count down days to that party that's coming up. We count down all the time. Our, our minds drift to the future. And here's the reason why. We drift to the future because God made us for something greater than this world and something in us tells us it's coming. Now, sadly, human beings tend to either distract themselves from that future longing or seek to satisfy it with temporary things. We do that all the time. Having been made to be with God and to be possessed by God and to look forward to returning to that state, we we tend to distract ourselves from that idea and drift towards secondary joys that can never fulfill that future longing. Randy Alcorn, the author, says this, nothing is more often misdiagnosed than our homesickness for heaven. We think that what we want is sex, drugs, alcohol, a new job, a raise, a doctorate, a spouse, a large screen television, a new car, a cabin in the woods, a condo in Hawaii. What we really want is the person we were made for, Jesus, and the place we were made for heaven. Nothing less can satisfy us. Take a moment and think about your future drifting thoughts. How many of them are fixed on your future in Christ? Take a moment. Think about what thoughts, if I were to say, what's the most important thing coming up for you right now? 
Wouldn't it often go to temporary things? I have a project at work. My child has a birthday. We're due in a few weeks. I'm going to get married next year. I'm hoping to pay off my house. I'm hoping to buy a house. I'm hoping to find an apartment. Doesn't it drift to those kinds of things? I think Paul wants our mind to be fixed on the future we have in Christ, the future of being claimed by God, God's own inheritance. He he wants our, our mind fixed on that so that our heart can be filled with the praise of his glory. Because a mind fixed on the future in Christ is a heart filled with the praise of his glory. A mind fixed on lesser joys is a heart that's distracted from God. A mind that is fixed on our future in Christ is a heart filled with the praise of his glory. But a mind fixed on lesser futures is a heart that is distracted from God. That's just the way we're made. Our present indicates our thoughts about our future. Our present actions indicate our thoughts about our future. That's always the way we are as humans. What we think about our future is revealed in how we feel about our present. Let God's purpose for you in the future shape your thoughts of God in the present. Let God's purpose for you in the future, let God, God's purpose for me, for us in the future, let it shape our thoughts of God in the present. We've been claimed by God to God's glory. Unless we have any doubt, we have also been sealed by God. God, sealed by God. Point number two, sealed by God. In him you also, Paul says, verse 13, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance. You were sealed. The idea has this, you you can think of a, a seal that declares authenticity. This is an authentic. This is a genuine. This is marked. This has ownership stamped on it. It is sealed. It cannot be broken. It is known. It is declared. It is related. There is authentic certainty attached to this person. That's the idea. And the seal is none less than the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying to the Ephesian believers is, if you doubt, and well you should, that God really would make you for himself, don't doubt any longer because he's given you himself as the seal of authenticity. How could God declare with certainty that we would be at home with him, possessed by him forever? Well, if he made his home in us now, wouldn't that declare God's intention and willingness? God does not inhabit anything lightly. Isn't that true? God doesn't inhabit anything lightly. God doesn't just come into things lightly. God comes in and people die. That's what happens when God comes into things. God comes in, sinners die. But somehow, the Holy Spirit has indwelt believers, which is God's seal that this one has a home with me forever. Because if God can indwell a still imperfect Christian, then he can certainly have that Christian at home with him in heaven when they are made perfect. If God can live in you now with all of your ongoing struggles, ongoing difficulties, ongoing cravings and self-satisfaction, if God can dwell in me now when I get angry at my children still, when I'm impatient with other drivers on the road still, when I crave things that I shouldn't have, if God can dwell in me now, then no wonder it's a seal of confidence. God's going to let me be with him forever sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is true of every Christian. Every Christian has this seal of God's indwelling spirit coming within them as the mark of authenticity. God has claimed me. How do you know? I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. How do you know that? Well, it's clear in the Bible that apart from the Spirit, no one can call Jesus Lord. So apart from the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't love this Jesus that saved me. I wouldn't care about the grace of God, and I wouldn't be looking forward to heaven. So the only explanation for those things is the sealing of the Holy Spirit. 
sealed. You have this certainty. You've been sealed. Now, it's important to notice the sealing of the Spirit and the guarantee of our future happens concurrently with the fact that we have heard and believed in the gospel. Did you, did you notice that? When did this happen? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. Now, now here, here we have the mystery of God's sovereignty and human action. S- somehow, God sovereignly chooses people to set them apart for himself forever. He saves them. He regenerates their heart. But in human experience, they hear and believe. How does that work out? I don't know exactly, but that's what it says. When were you sealed? When you heard and believed. When did God decide that you would hear and believe in eternity past? Who was the ultimate mover that moved your heart to believe what you heard? The Holy Spirit. What did you do? I heard and believed. What does that mean for us? What well, means as Christians, we should be telling people the good news of salvation because some of those people will hear and believe and be sealed with the Holy Spirit. God already knows who they are, but he wants us to tell them. God doesn't seal people with the Holy Spirit or send them to heaven without them having heard and believed. This strikes against those who assume a confidence in heaven. I remember talking to a a young man a number of years ago. He was a friend of mine, and he was having a difficult time in his life, and we were just discussing his salvation, and, and he was very kind to just freely talk to me about it, and, and he said, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, he grew up in the church. He knew all the right answers. He said, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I said, okay, let's, let's just assume for a moment that you're not a Christian. Let's just, just, we don't know, but let's just assume that you have not yet become a Christian. You haven't yet believed in Jesus. What's going to happen to you when you die if, if that's the case? Assuming you're not, a, we don't know, but let's assume you're not. His answer surprised me. He said, well, I, I would end up in heaven. Really? Now, this is not an an ignorant person, never heard about the Christian faith. He knows that how you get into heaven is believing in Jesus. He heard it from his infancy. But somehow in his mind, there was this irrational confidence, God would surely not keep me out of heaven. Surely not. Maybe it's because I I grew up in a Christian family or I know about the gospel. Maybe that's sufficient. I I know the the message of the gospel. I can repeat it to you. Or or maybe it's just some false view that that God is is in the end kind of a big Santa Claus. He's kind of a universalist. And at the end of the day, he's going to say, well, we we tried to get you to believe, but you didn't. And so we're just going to let you all in anyway. Maybe maybe it's some kind of thought like that. I, I don't know. But his confidence was real and genuine. He knew it was inaccurate but it was real nonetheless. There might be people here this morning that that's true for you. God would never keep me out of heaven. Maybe even you've heard the doctrines of grace and that's given you a sort of confidence. Well, God's gracious. He chooses people. I mean, he put me in a Christian, you know, circumstances and I I grew up going to church or something and and so that must mean by grace I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. We, we need to benefit from the occasion that Paul describes here. Yes, yes, Christians are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that seal is inviolable. It cannot be taken away. It cannot be removed from you. You can't wander away from it. He won't lose you. Those who are saved are sealed definitely. It is a guarantee, it says, of our inheritance, and our inheritance is to be God's inheritance, all right? Our inheritance is to be possessed by God, and it's a guarantee. When God guarantees something, it happens, and God guarantees that those who have been saved will be with him in heaven, but those who have been saved heard and believed. So if if you're here today and You're not sure if you're a Christian, but you've just assumed you're going to go to heaven. Here's my recommendation. Believe. Believe that Jesus is the only Savior for a sinner like you and me. Believe. You will not go to heaven because your mom and dad are there. 
You will not go to heaven because you went to church 40 years ago as a child. You will not go to heaven because you're in church today. That is not why you'll be in heaven. You'll not go to heaven because you're nicer than your neighbor. That's not why I'm going to be in heaven. You're not going to go to heaven because you were kind and more often than you were unkind. That, 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 that's not going to be why you're in heaven. That's not what God's grace means. God's grace is given to those who also have believed that Jesus died for their sins, that he was raised from the dead, and that that person has saved them from the wrath they deserve. That's the only reason that I or you or any of us will be in heaven. And so believing means casting your confidence away from yourself and your background and your parents and your heritage and any good deeds you've done and saying, my only confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ and I need him to save me and I believe that he will. And when you confess and believe that, then the guarantee of God's promised inheritance is given to you. Then and only then can you be sure that you will be in heaven. When assurance is presumption, faith is flimsy. When assurance is presumption, faith is flimsy. When assurance is Biblical faith is genuine. Sealed and guaranteed. Sealed and guaranteed. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells a believer as a guarantee. The word could mean the first payment on a a final full inheritance. Or we might think of the first fruits of a harvest that guarantees the rest. The idea is once God himself has come to live inside a believer, there is no doubt, there is no question that that believer will be with God forever. He is the guarantee, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until, the actual word again means the release of the possession, the redemption of the possession. That moment when the the inheritance that has been claimed is finally fully enjoyed. We must not attach this passage, the idea that God is lonely, is needy, is wringing his hands, hoping for friendship in heaven, and finally, finally, somebody to play with. That that is not God. The idea that God has decided to set his own (laughs) attention and intention towards us in the future can only point us back to the miracle of God's grace. But that's what the passage says. God, one day, will redeem fully this possession that is every Christian. And when he looks down, he sees himself in the person of the Holy Spirit marking those that will one day be finally and fully in his unveiled presence. Now, application questions for you. Is your mind fixed on your future in Christ? To be God's possession, to be owned by God? Is your mind fixed on your future in Christ? Let me ask you some questions. If, if you are in your middle or older years, I'll let that be self-designated, okay? If you're in your middle or older years, what does this mean? Don't waste the latter part of your life in regret or regression. Don't waste the latter part of your life in regret or regression. Don't regret the past as the dominating emotion that you experience and don't regress away from a passionate pursuit of the Lord because after all, it's the end and I deserve a break. This whole life is just the barest of slimmest beginnings to an eternal purpose. There is no great difference 
from the ages of 20 to 30 and the ages of 70 to 80 or 10 to 20 and the ages of 50 to 60. There is no great difference when compared with eternity and God's purpose for us in Christ. Let let your future in Christ determine your passion and your pursuit in your middle and your later years. Don't let your middle and your later years be defined by the brief short time it took to get you there. Let them be defined by the eternity you have in in front of you. And let your future in Christ fill your heart with passionate praise until the day you see him. If you're in your younger years, don't race for earthly prominence or comfort. Look to the future in Christ. Don't race for it. It's astonished me how many young guys uh, I've talked to over the years and say, how are you enjoying your job? Ah, it's fine. Don't see myself staying there very long. Now, I, you would expect that to be true for some. Some young men maybe have a really lousy job or something. But it's, it's pretty categorical. That'll be the, ah, don't see myself there long. And I start to wonder over the years, is Is there maybe a discontentedness, the assumption of a kind of earthly prominence and an accelerated track, a a quick rise to fame and money that maybe is present in a younger generation? I, I think possibly there is. What's the solution to that? Well, just learn to love less. Well, maybe at some level, but it also could be said, learn to be excited about something greater. If your mind is often plagued by anxiety, is your mind often plagued by anxiety? This is true for a lot of Christians I know. Anxiety is the constant background noise. Think of your future in Christ. Think of it. Think of your future in Christ. Think about how small every anxiety you could think of is compared to your future in the Lord Jesus Christ being possessed by God. If heaven has become distasteful to you, think of your future in Christ. And let me issue this as a warning. If the idea of being owned and possessed by God, be honest with yourself, if that vocabulary and that truth strikes you as dull or disinteresting, be warned. Be provoked by this passage. It may be that you have started to become consumed with lesser joys and your appetite has diminished for greater joys. If, if the phrase, you have been chosen of God to be his own possession, strikes you as uh, somewhat presumptuous of God or somewhat annoying of God or certainly disinteresting, be warned by this passage. Those who have no taste for heaven will not finally be there. Those who have no taste for heaven will not finally be there. Thankfully, Jesus has not returned yet for those in that condition, and you can now fill your mind with thoughts of a future in Christ until your heart overflows to the praise of his glory. Consider the magnitude of the privilege that God has chosen you for his own inheritance to be his own prized possession. If heaven has become distasteful to you, think of your future in Christ. If you are distracted by temporary joys, you know, some of us, and and all of us do this at some level, we we can kind of run from one temporary joy to the other, trying to briefly satisfy our hearts. One one joy to the next. Okay, yeah, okay, next week I got that fun party, and then after that we have vacation, and then I get the raise at work, and then after that I'm going to have a a nice dinner at home, and then we, we kind of just run from one thing to the next, trying to satisfy something inside of us. 
But think of your future in Christ. C.S. Lewis, a classic quote here, but I'll read it again. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. If you're distracted by temporary joys, fix your mind on your future in Christ. What am I saying? I'm saying Christians meditate on heaven and the God who is the center of heaven and the confidence that you will be there with him. If your heart is bruised by suffering, past or present, and there are those in our church whose life is bruised by suffering, fix your mind on your future in Christ. If you've been disappointed by people, if they've let you down, if relationships have struggled, if you look and peer into a future that seems bleak and discouraging, fix your mind on your future in Christ. It's your future in Christ that will help you to sustain and endure and love and serve in the midst of a world that bruises, that bruises us as bruised reeds are bruised and bent and broken. But we are going to one who will not break a bruised reed and will not quench a faintly burning wick. We are going to one who will straighten every bruised reed and perfect every suffering saint. That's who we're going to. That's who we're going to. So if you're bu bruised by suffering, fix your mind on your future in Christ to the praise of his glory. Final category, if your worship is mechanical, Think of your future in Christ. You know what I mean by that, a mechanical worship. Say on Sunday mornings, you come in and you sing songs. There's a kind of mechanical nature about it. It, it might be basically the same if there was a, a tape recorder in my chair. Wouldn't be that much different. <laughs> We all do that at some point. We, we find ourselves distracted. Oh yeah, we're supposed to be singing. I'm thinking lunch or work or chores or didn't, did, I, did I do that chore? I, I can't remember. If your worship has become mechanical, fix your mind on your future in Christ. Prepare your heart now for the worship of heaven. To the praise of his glory. Very soon Christmas morning is coming. Not the first one, but the second one. When the Savior will return, he will come again. It's the ultimate Christmas morning. And God has gifts he has set aside for himself. Gifts that no one else would think of as gifts. And he has placed tags for himself on those gifts to God, from God, by Christ. It's his people. Let's count down the days. That Christmas is coming. Let's count down the days when God will possess us forever to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord Jesus, we rejoice in your grace. We rejoice in our future in Christ. We rejoice in in the inheritance we have of being inherited by you. You are our 
inheritance. For some reason, we have been made yours, which makes no sense, Lord, but we declare to you, we, we would rather no inheritance but you. We can have nothing greater than to be in your presence. There is no greater beauty, no greater joy, no greater majesty, no more infinite, overwhelming experience than to see and worship and fellowship with you, our God, and that is precisely what you have given to us. And so we anticipate that day and we bend our lives towards that day and we fix our minds on that day and we cast aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely so that we can focus on that day. We look forward to being redeemed fully from this earth and being made your possession forever. And we rejoice also in the Holy Spirit who has been given to us as a guarantee. And we thank you for all the evidence of the Holy Spirit present in this church. Those who believe Jesus is Lord. Those who are serving with passion. Those who are sharing the gospel with the lost. Holy Spirit, that is your work among us. And the greatest gift of those evidences is that it points us to the guarantee that we will be with you forever. We thank you and we rejoice in you. Receive our worship and our thankfulness as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.